Let's um, take a moment to pray together and then we will get started in the class today. Can I request somebody to please pray with us and we will start. Shall I pray first? Go ahead, please pray. Thank you. Father God, the creator of heaven and earth, we bow down to you in admiration and adoration, Father, for this new day that has come into our lives, Father. And as we sit in your presence to hear from you, learn from you, Father, we ask your wisdom, your favor, a fresh anointing, Father, so that we, with open-mindedness, Father, we receive everything in our spirit, Father, and be walking in it, Father, and give you glory, honor, and praise that you only deserve. Once again, thank you for this day. Thank you for Pastor. Thank you for leading us into this beautiful uh, Lord Father, teaching on holiness, Father, may it continue to grow in us and serve your purposes. Thank you for everyone. We give you glory, honor, and praise, and ask this prayer in the precious and matchless name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. 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 Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC 209, the class on Course on Holiness. It's our second lecture uh, this week. Thank you for connecting to the class. Um, on Monday, towards the end of the class, uh, we, we, we did not answer uh, a question um, and that came from Christopher. And we said uh, we will begin the class today by looking at his question. So can we do that? Can we please, um, Christopher, could you please share that question one more time uh, with all of us so that um, then we can do our, we can try to answer that. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Pastor. I've um, I just put it in chat. I've made some, made a few changes um, to that question. Um, one minute. All right, so we have this question here from Christopher. I'm just going to read it out and then if we please provide some detail. The first sin by Lucifer in respect to desire of the flesh. A comment, it seems that absolute good and different levels of evil existed from the beginning of the beginning. This happened in heaven in the presence of the Lord. So God is absolute and eternal good, and yet there exist some levels of contamination and angels have fallen and got tarnished. Can this happen again and we as believers are taken up to heaven will and appeared along with our glorious bodies? Hmm. Interesting question. Um, I understand what you're saying. So basically the correct question is, um, we had uh, the we had Lucifer, who was an archangel. Who, I mean, if, when God created everything, He created everything perfect. Uh, His presence is perfect. Everything He created is perfect, holy, without sin. And yet, uh, Lucifer, who was in heaven in the presence of God, sinned, and it was. His sin, it was, you know, basically it started off with, we say, from self-deception, and he sinned. And then other angels were deceived with him, and they also joined him. So a third of the angels, basically. And all of this happened in a very perfect environment, in a perfect, you know, in the presence of God. So the question is, even after believers are glorified, have the resurrected bodies, are in the presence of God, can even believers do the same thing? 
end up doing the same thing. Now, let me give you a logical answer and let me give you, uh, you know, an answer of faith, meaning logically, if you go by the same logic of what we have just described, then the answer is yes, because human beings, are, we believers are free moral agents and we will be free moral agents even in heaven. Uh, which means we could rebel, just like the angels who did. So going, going logically, the answer is yes. But looking at it from a faith perspective, that means somehow, you know, whatever God has done in the whole redemptive story, in the whole plan of redemption, making us new creation in Christ, and putting us in Christ, and then, you know, whatever is going to follow, meaning us being glorified and taking, being in the presence of God. I believe there is a mystery there. There's a mystery there. You say, why do you say there's a mystery? Because in redemption, God did something that never was never done before. You say, what is it? And that's the mystery. In the plan of redemption, God put us in him and he came into us, which is something that never happened in the past. And it's, 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 it's completely here what God did. You know, He put us in him and he came into us. And so there is this, this mystery, meaning, God went a step beyond ever before in bringing us into Christ and Christ coming into us. And therefore, uh, while I, I call it as a mystery because there, there's so much there we, we still don't know, we don't understand, but God has done it. Spiritually, he's made us one with Christ, which the angels were not. You know, we have been made one with Christ. And so that is the, the faith answer, the mystery part, which I say, you know, yeah, which I say that somehow in there, there is a secret to keeping everything pure and holy together forever. Otherwise, I mean, everything God did, you know, uh, uh, you know, the whole plan of redemption, it's not going to, you know, it, it's, let's say it's a perfect solution. So it has a solution that will have eternal impact. And that's what the Bible says, you know, that for the ages to come, we will declare, this is Ephesians uh, 2, for ages to come, we are going to be declaring, you know, what God has done for us in Christ. So in that mystery, I, also, I believe there is also this answer to securing everything, but he gathers together everything in Christ, you know. And in that, I believe there is an answer, there is the answer to keep us, to keep such a thing from ever happening again. I say it's a mystery because I, you know, we cannot put our finger on it and say, this is the formula that's going to prevent this from happening ever again. But yet, I say, in that mystery, the Bible says, in the ages to come, we're going to worship God, that he's going to gather together everything in Christ. That's, you know, so in that mystery, there is the answer. Logically, yeah, of course, you go through the same logic. Lucifer sin, anybody can sin through by just rebelling. But in the mystery of God, there is a solution, is what? We can say by faith. Um, is that okay, Christopher? Okay, so the, now we're, we're going back to the first question. Is how did Lucifer and the angels have self-deception and revolt in uh, this perfect world? Yeah, so self-deception just begins by a wrong notion, a wrong idea. 
See, that's what happened to Lucifer, right? So Lucifer was created so perfect. Um, but between his head and his heart, I'm just trying to say it like this, between his head and his heart, in other words, between his thinking, uh, you know, just be between, within himself, the point is, within himself, his own thought process, he went wrong. He said, I will ascend to the Most High, you know, to the Most High. I will become like the Most High. So it was something that he himself desired, and he deceived himself, thinking that he could have that, not realizing that he is a created being, God is creator. And there's a big difference, even though he, God, had given him, Lucifer, uh, wisdom and beauty and everything. But in his own internal thinking, reasoning, he deceived himself. He went wrong. So self-deception comes out of a wrong, believing a wrong notion, right? So God is not controlling our thoughts. He's not controlling our, um, you know, uh, how we think. He, he's created each of us as, as um, beings who have the capacity to think. So also the angels, and uh, that's how it happened. Yeah, all right, um, good. Any other questions before we move forward? Any anybody else? Any other questions? Okay, so uh, let's go into our lesson. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share the PDF. So uh, we are now in this uh, this chapter where we, we and we're going to break things down on each of these three aspects: the flesh, the world, the devil. Uh, our in, our our objective is, you know, let's kind of break it down. Let's get into uh, you know at the microscopic level. Let's zoom in to see, yeah, you know, how does all this work when we face temptation, the flesh. Or we face the pull, or the pressure of the world around us, or the temptations uh, and the work of the devil in a, in a, and trying to you know pull us into sin and keep us from a life of holiness. So if we understand it and we know how to you know uh, uh, how to fight it, how to battle it, uh, we can walk uh, in in the victory that God wants us to have. So we started talking about um, uh, what James said in James chapter one, uh, verses 13 to 16, uh, when it comes to temptation. So what James has taught us is, uh, you know, we shouldn't blame God, right? Uh, for the temptations we face, God is not the one doing it, but it is happening because our own desires are pulling us, right? Now, how our own desires uh, are um, um, stirred up could be many ways. I mean, it could just be something that, you know, you see or, you know, you, um, you, uh, the, you know, that, that, that appeals to you, or sometimes it could be thoughts that the enemy puts, or it could be influences from people around us. Now our desires are stirred up and it is our desires that are drawing us down, that drawing us, he's drawn away by his own desires. The word drawn away simply means to, you know, to bring out into a place of vulnerability. It's like you're drawing, bringing, drawing somebody out of their place of safety into a place where they can be, where they are vulnerable. So that's, that's the idea that, you know, you, you bring them out. So you're drawn by his own desire. So our desires pull us out of our own place of safety into a place where we are vulnerable, we're going to fall and enticed. So here, this is a bait, a trap. So getting out of your place of security into a place where you can be trapped and, you know, where sin can overpower us. So that's what our desires do to us. Now, 
we must keep in mind, of course, there are good desires and there are bad desires. And there are normal desires. Normal desires like, okay, we all desire to eat and sleep and, you know, uh, the simple things. These are normal desires. They're part of us. And there are also good desires. You want to bless people. You want to serve people. They, you want to help. And, you know, these are good, good desires. But then there are desires that tempt us. That means they, won't, they pull us to do sinful things. That's what we're talking about. That is temptation. And our own desires are pulling us in the wrong direction. So um, we spoke about this whole uh, issue of a carnally minded flesh ruled believer. When we read Romans chapter eight verses one to 13, which uh, we have um, referenced here one more time. So basically, uh, as a believer, a believer can be carnally minded or he can be spiritually minded. And to be carnally minded means he's living in accordance to the flesh. That means he is giving in to the pull of the flesh. To be spiritually minded, he is yielding to the Holy Spirit. He is letting the Holy Spirit influence him. He's letting the Holy Spirit lead him. He's letting the Holy Spirit um, uh, direct him. So he's living and he's walking in accordance to the Spirit. Right. So every believer has a choice. You can be a con someone can be a carnally minded flesh ruled believer, or someone can be a spiritually minded, spirit led believer, or spirit filled believer. Right. So we have discussed this passage already in detail, and so you know, if if we are living according to the flesh. Uh, we are going to die. Um, you know, it has its consequences. Yeah, you know, it's not. It's not something to be taken lightly. Right? So I say, oh, I, I, I'm a believer, but it's okay for me to live according to the flesh. It's not okay, because if you live according to the flesh, what will happen? You, it, you will not please God. Uh, there will be no peace, and to lead us to death. You're talking about the believer. A believer living according to the flesh is not going to be pleasing to God. He's not going to have peace and he's going to eventually end up in death. He's going to be self-destruct, basically. Right? So we will end up living defeated lives. And not only that, but First Peter 2, 11 says that fleshly lusts war against our own soul. You know, that means if we give in to the fleshly lusts, and you're living according to the desires of the flesh, what happens? It's going to destroy your own soul. It's going to destroy, it's warring against, it's, it's like you know, it's fighting against one's own soul, mind, will, and emotions. And it's going to you know, work against our own mind, will, and emotions. And our emotions are going to be hurt and disturbed. And so, uh, we must understand there are consequences, even for a believer living according to the flesh. Right? So our goal is to learn how to overcome the flesh. How, how, how must I do this? Right? How do we do it? So understand, and, and I'm just repeating this one more time here, Galatians 6, that if we sow to the flesh, we will of the flesh reap corruption. That means whenever I give in to the wrong desires of my flesh, understand, it's leading only to corruption. That means it's degrading me. It's corrupting me. I'm a believer, but I'm giving into the flesh. It's resulting in corruption degrading, destroying, whether it's destroying my soul, destroying, could in some cases, it's destructive to the physical body, and surely it's detrimental to the spiritual condition of the believer. But if we sow to the Spirit, we're going to enjoy what comes from the life of God. Right? So that means, I face, I'm facing the desire of the pull of my flesh. 
like you said, the desires of the flesh. Yeah, it's there. I'm not denying it. We all feel it. But instead of giving into that, we are making a deliberate choice to sow to the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. I, uh, I choose you. I choose to what pleases you. I choose to walk in the Spirit. I choose to live filled with the Spirit. And when we do that, we're going to reap or we're going to enjoy the harvest of what comes from everlasting life. That is the Zoe life of God. We're going to enjoy that. What does the Zoe life of God bring? It, it, it brings all of God to us. It dispels darkness. Right? So how do we do this? First, we must know we are free from the power of sin. Right? And this is something we have learned yeah, both in our lesson on our identity in Christ, uh, and we also when we talk about the cross of Christ, uh, this is something we touch upon over and over again. I think every year, uh, in all the three years, this is something we see, we repeat. Know that you are free from the power of sin. You know, and this is such a powerful truth because when you know that sin will not have dominion over you then you know that you can be free. You can walk free. You know, so that's the first thing. Now, you know, as a pastor, um, I do have the, uh, the privilege of listening to the life stories of many, many people. They come and they share their struggles. And believers share you know, how they're trapped in pornography and, you know, and all, all ages, you know, uh, whether it's just recently, someone who I would say is just in, like still in school. So, you, you know, 16 years of age, something like that. Okay, and just, oh, I'm struggling with pornography, you know, so whether they are 16 or 20 or 25 or 35 or whatever, you know, even upwards. Believers, we're talking about believers. You know, struggling with different kinds of sins. And sins in the area of sexuality, it's a big battle for all of us. And um, we all face those battles. And the area of sexuality, our sexual appetites, um, which are God-given, God created it, God designed us as sexual beings. So that is not sinful by itself. God designed it, it's part of us. But he also gave us, you know, this is how you exercise, or how you satisfy your sexual appetites. He told us how to you know what is a proper way. But as believers, we struggle because this area has been corrupted. And so we have to sanctify it, bring it, keep it holy, right? So as believers, there's a struggle. You know, and I remember a young man, and he was just in his early 20s. And his problem was his phone and his computer. He said, he, he, like, it's almost like he couldn't help himself. Anytime he was alone, and uh, you know, in his house, he had his own room, where, where he was staying with his parents, and uh, he had his own room, he had his own computer and phone, and uh, all the time, he said, uh, it's addicted, you know, when he's just sitting there, he's pulled into pornography. I've had uh, married men, you know, married men, they have they're married, they have wife, and they have family, they have kids, and addicted to pornography. Now I'm talking about believers, I'm not talking about people who are not saved, I'm talking about people in church, you know, and... Um, 
and the big problem is the computer, the phone, the mobile phone. Because these are devices that <laughs> connect us to the world and there's access to all kinds of filthy things. And, but that holds people in bondage. I heard, uh, and an evangelist, you know, I was ministering in a city, particular city, you know, doing a conference for pastors, break time. We were just having all, we had just, you know, we had break, so I was just having tea and biscuits with the pastors and one evangelist came to me and he was elderly, you know, I would say uh, in his fifties, maybe. He came to me, he said, I want to talk to you. Okay, so we went aside. He said, you know, this is my problem. I start watching a sermon on YouTube. Next thing I know, I'm watching pornography. Now, of course, the way the YouTube search algorithm works is it knows you. <laughs> the YouTube recommendation algorithms know you better than you know yourself. So you can go there to watch a sermon, but what is recommended to you is based on your previous activity and they're recommending pornography. Can you imagine? He's watching a sermon, but YouTube on the side is recommending pornography. Why? Because that's what he's done before on YouTube. YouTube remembers that. And that becomes a bait, right? And so he said, this is what I'm doing. I go to watch, this, and this is an evangelist, you know, I mean, he's, he's doing things in the ministry. I mean, I don't know, I don't know all that he was doing, but uh, he said, and this is a man in his, uh, you know, I, I'm just, I don't know his exact age, but I'm just assuming somewhere in the fifties. So this, this is something, I'm talking about believers whether they are teenagers, 20s, married people, or even those in the ministry. Right? It's the area of sexuality, uh, uh, the flesh, the, the sexual appetites is controlling. Now, remember something. Sexual appetites are not wrong. God gave it to us, just like uh, what to say, food, food appetite, appetite for food. It's not wrong. God gave it to us. Appetite for recreation, I mean, to enjoy things around us, for relaxing, for resting. These are not wrong. They were designed by God as part of us, so we can enjoy it. You, know, you can relax however you want, you know, whatever good things. You know, it's, all, it's all part of our makeup, but it all has to be um, exercised the way God God wanted us to exercise these things. So, what is the first step when when believers find themselves being controlled by some sin? Now, I'm mentioning sexual sexual sin because that's that's very common. But then there are other things, you know, uh, for example, having a bad temper. Oh, that's again, it's something, it's hard to understand, but I've met people and these are church people. They come to church every Sunday. They love God sincerely, but when they are at home, they just lose their temper and they do violent things. And these are the same people who come to church, love God, or lift hands and worship. But when at home, uh, uh, you know, this, this anger, temper, is a big problem. And it, it impacts the marriage. And, uh, you know, the wife and the children suffer just because the husband is not, uh, you know, it could happen to anybody. I'm just giving one example. Uh, because the husband is not able to control anger. Now, anger is a work of the flesh, we read. We read, you know, wrath or uh, anger. It's a, it's a thing of the flesh. But that's another area of uh, problem. There are many other things. For example, a lady, and this lady must have been in her 
uh, yeah, she must be in her fifth, late 50s, I think. She said, I have a problem. I said, oh, what is it? She said, I shop online and I just spend money online. I just buy things online, things I don't need. Uh, I'm just, you know, I'm just, my house is full of things. I, I can't control myself. Now, you know, for some of us, that may be a very strange problem. <laughs> But it's, this is what her problem was. She said, I can't control myself. I just have to spend money buying things online. I feel good about it. And, and it's like an addiction. It's controlling her. So, you know, there are all kinds of um, fleshly desires that are holding believers captive. Now, how can believers live a free life? I do believe in deliverance. I do believe. Right? So when people come and for prayer, especially, okay, I'll, we lay hands, we will break the bondages, we will, you know, if uh, controlling spirits, we, we will pray to, for their deliverance. I do believe it. But that is not the answer. Why? Because we must learn to walk free. Deliverance can set you free. But the next day, the person can go back into bondage if they're not careful. So what's the real answer? Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So he didn't just say, know the truth, you'll be free. He said, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. So deliverance is important. It is good. But what's really important is every believer must learn how to live by the word. That's how they stay free. Otherwise, you know, we can pray. They'll be delivered instantly. Bondages can be broken. But if they don't know how to abide in the word, the enemy can easily come and take them captive again. And they'll be back in line for prayer again. Now God will deliver them again. But our goal should be, let us teach them. Let us bring the truth to them. So that they, when you continue the way, they know the truth. You must be established in the truth. Then you can live free. Right? So, first thing. So if I went on a side journey here. Coming back to the notes here, first thing, we must know the truth. The truth is, we are free from the power of sin, first. Right? Uh, and we don't have a sinful nature. You know, uh, sometimes you hear in certain parts of the Christian world, people teaching, oh, we have a sinful nature, that's why we sin. Well. That's, first of all, that's not what the Bible says. And secondly, if you teach believers that, how are they going to live victorious? If you tell a believer, you have a sinful nature, you're going to sin, then why does he even have to fight some sin? He's, he's got it inside him. But that's not the truth. The truth is, we don't have a sinful nature. The old man was crucified. And we are partakers of divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. So yeah. that's the truth. That truth must be taught. It must be emphasized. You are a new creation, created in the image of God and righteousness and true holiness. True holiness is part of your nature. That's who you are. That is who the new creation is. The new creation is a holy person created in true holiness and on the cross, the old man was crucified so that the power of sin of our lives is broken and uh, uh, you know, we are free from the dominion of sin. Right? So we must know this. We're free from the power of sin. Right? That's the truth that must settle in us. Next is we have to use the word. We have to use the word in relation to our area of weakness. 
Now we know the scripture. How can a young man cleanse his way? He has to pay attention to the word of God. So the word of God is what we need. You know, the word of God does a lot for us. It washes us. It removes the filth. It renews our mind. That means it reprograms, retrains our thinking so that this renewed mind is the spiritual mind. That's what we want. And so it retrains our thinking. And uh, we have to use the word in relation to the area of weakness. So example, if um, lying is a problem. Now, so for some believers, this is a serious problem. Again, I've met people like that, where they don't want to lie, they lie. Or it's, 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 it's a part of them. And I've also seen some very serious cases. Now, I'm talking about believers, where they have built, or what to say, their whole world has been built on a lie. I've seen people in ministry. That means they were standing in front of the church ministering. And then they went and built a whole world on lies. Lying, 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 lying. Built, you know. So I'm talking about believers having lying is a problem. Whether it, you know, all kinds, all kinds, all kinds of scenarios. So if lying is, I'm just using this as an example. If we have lying as a problem, we know it's a weakness. And, you know, we lie maybe to look nice in front of people. We lie maybe to uh, get things from people. We lie maybe to, you know, escape from whatever, whatever. So many, it's all kinds of motivations could be there behind this whole lifestyle of lying. I'm talking believers who have this as a sinful pattern. You know, it's not just one occasional thing here and there, but it's like it's become a habit. It's a lifestyle. It's a sinful pattern. How do you break out of it? Well, first know that lying cannot control you. Yeah, that demon. So lying, in one, in some cases, is just a bad habit, and in some cases, it's a bondage to a demon. Right. So whatever it is, whether it's just a habit that's been developed, or whether it's a bondage to, you know, they've given into this demonic power that's controlling them. Whatever it is, that sin, the power of that sin, has been broken. Second, you have to take the word of God. Take the word of God. See, the word of God is what we need. Without the word, we cannot fight. Cannot fight. So this thing will not go away by, you know, just making a decision, oh, I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's good to make a decision. But as a believer, God has given us his word. You have to take the word. So I've just given a few scriptures. You could use many more. You know, so you take a few scriptures like this. Proverbs 20, truthful lips will be established forever lying tongues for a moment. My mouth will speak truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. Proverbs 8, 7. Or Ephesians 4, 25. Put, lying, put away lying. Speak truth. Right? Or let the Words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your sight, or set a guard over my mouth, keep watch over to do that. So you take all these scriptures and then you have to use it. Use the scriptures. Use it. Speak the scriptures in prayer. Go before God. Now, God, I want to do this. Speak the scriptures over yourself because your mind and body has to, you know, needs to hear it and needs to be cleansed by it. And then speak the word as a weapon every time there's a temptation to lie. So you're in a situation. You are going to say something, but you know what you're saying is lying. Oh, that's when you use the sword of the Spirit. No, 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 no. The Word of God says, let the words of our mouth, let it be acceptable in your eyes. Oh, I've got to stop. Cannot. 
I'm using the word. And if I need to just get away and speak the word, you know, so I, I do it. Speak the word. So what are you doing? You're using the word as a sword against, you know, we're just taking this example, lying against this fleshly desire, this fleshly weakness of lying. You're taking the sword of the spirit to fight it. But we cannot do it without the word of God. So important. Like this, you know, you can look at other areas. Um, uh, sexual immorality. Uh, and then you can, you know, uh, there's so many areas. These are all the common areas. I was just listing, uh, you know, talking about believers, right? We're not talking about just the general world people. You know, these are things that believers struggle. We all struggle in the flesh. In the flesh. We all face it. You know, none of us are exempt. And we have all seen. Everyone, everyone, believers, whether they are apostles or prophets, or whether they are little young people in church, you know, everybody fights all of these things. You know, so don't think somebody who is some great apostle or some great prophet doesn't have all this, they're facing all this. And uh, you, you know, you, you may not see it up there behind the pulpit, but when they're off the pulpit, all these things, everybody faces. And we all have to battle it the same way, which is with the word of God. So I'm gonna pause here and we will pick up from here uh, on, on sexual immorality next week, but um, Let's see if there are any questions on things so far. I'm, I'm purposely going slow uh, because this, these things are very important. Right? So I'm just it has to soak into our hearts and we need to understand how to fight. Okay, let's look at if there are any questions here. Uh, it is desire that there should be strong teaching within every church about believers living and leading to destruction. Um, I um, sorry, but Mano, I didn't I didn't understand the question. Is that a question or no? Pastor, it's a general statement. Mm. Uh, what I observe is very really, uh, in uh, most of the contemporary churches, there is no strong teaching against believers living in in the fleshful natures. Mm. So mm. that's what I feel. Mm. Some years earlier, there was a strong teaching in churches, but mm. now it is slowly it is. Dividing. It is uh, uh, the teaching on a holy living is in most of the churches, it is reduced and replaced by a prosperity teaching and uh, such related, related things. That's mm. what I have observed. Mm. It's just my observation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a fair observation uh, that uh, we need to, I, I mean, that. That so see sometimes there is the pressure as a pastor and a teacher to uh, to dwell on all the nice things you know God wants to bless you and do you good which is all true you know of course God is a good God but uh, the teaching on holiness or fighting the flesh or those things are not very what to say popular. And so, but but it's the word of God, and we have to teach it. We have to teach the entire counsel of God. Yeah. Okay. Any questions, please? Any thoughts? Yes, Krista. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Pastor. Um, I, I just want to. Do um let me talk through um maybe a, a real life example of um you know uh, uh Ravi Zach Zacharias who who um you know passed away and most of the things actually got uncovered um uh, you know when when he actually uh 
had already passed away. Um, so in a in a in a sort of a hypothetical uh, situation, and this could apply to you know pastors or even people who are uh, uh, you know in in public life uh, very prominent. Um, if they have if they you know um, they declare to the world that they have they have they have they are they have sinned and um, they have um, they go go to God and you know um, ask for his forgiveness uh, in that scenario um, God will will forgive forgive them even though the, the their entire world would come crashing down mm. um, so I just wanted to get that I guess um, confirmation you and um, in some cases I mean I, I means you know uh, this could be a non non-believer uh, scenario you know of uh, you know this this uh, famous um, cyclist uh, Lance Armstrong who, mm. who actually had to go you know announce to the world that you know he had cheated and uh, you know he had taken uh, uh, steroids um, mm. you know when he, after he had won so many uh, so many um, you know Tour de France uh, um, medals so uh, uh, I think in some ways also because uh, you know people who are going to actually um, uh, you know um, really uh, you know let out the truth that you know that this had actually happened sometimes it is it's because um, they can't um, continue that life anymore and uh, the gather you know the um, the past or the present sometimes is you know is catching up on them so I guess from a point of view of forgiveness and um, um, that would that would be conclusive right that God will forgive them even even at that stage yes yes so the answer is yes, you know, uh, that, um, you know, when there is repentance, when there's a turning to God, God um, always forgives, he will cleanse and restore. But yes, in the, in the world, there are going to be repercussions, there are going to be consequences. But at least before God, there is forgiveness, you know. Uh, so that is yeah. The answer is yes. There is forgiveness. Yeah. Okay. So let's pause here for today. Um, Abraham. Yeah. Go ahead. You have about one minute. Go ahead. Yes, I wanted to ask a quick question concerning uh, temptation. I mean, I know that the idea of temptation to be in a season, but I have observed something that any time. I share, maybe I go to a meeting and I share and I think I, maybe the power of God is intense or we feel the power of God. Once I'm done with the meeting, there's sort of temptation that comes. Some of them will be like, well, why are you in ministry? Why are you wasting your time? I mean, you have traveled. I mean, get some, I mean, you can settle down, just marry, you know, like some ideas that are inconsistent with my normal life. I mean, if I have not done that meeting, those thoughts will never come. But after those meetings, it will come for like maybe a week. I have to pray and cast all those thoughts. Then I'll become normal. Then let's say after a month, after a session of, a, a, let's say, another season of meeting, then those things will come again. So is it, does it happen to do with uh, maybe some spiritual level that I, I try to get to? I don't really understand that kind of season that I'm going to, Pastor. Mm. I don't know if it's like that. Now, so you're saying after every time you, I mean, this this time of ministry, you you feel, why am like I doing this? Life, yes, like in my normal life, I will not have this kind of thoughts. I mean, everything is okay. I'm just happy serving the Lord. But mm -hmm. anytime I go to minister and I fulfill myself that, no, this one, the, the Lord is doing something or the Lord is using this message to change someone's life. Once I'm done with the meeting, at least for the next few days, sometimes those ideas keep coming. Like, why are you in ministry? Why don't you just uh, look for one of these Vietnamese ladies and shut it down? Why are you wasting your time? So I have to pray and cast all those things out. Then I'll be okay. It, it, I mean, I can be okay for like a month or two. But if I minister again under that function, those temptations will come again. 
So does it happen to you? Because I, I learned that sometimes there are some spiritual realms that when you are not up to, and then you try to challenge the principalities or something, they will come, they, they'll bring a back class and all those things. I don't really get that theory. theory to mm. Huh, I'm trying to understand. Um, uh, I think, I, I, know, I, I know we don't have much time. Maybe we can pick it up again next class. But I think, Abraham, this, you, you don't have to have it like this. I mean, imagine if you were a pastor, you would be ministering every weekend plus many times during the week. I mean, just imagine, and then you, you cannot go through such cycles at all. I mean, you know, you, you can't afford to do, have any such things. So uh, I, I, I would just say this because we have to stop. I would just say, you know, you just be fully convinced that you are doing what God wants you to do. There are no second thoughts about it. When you're ministering, you're doing what God wants you to do. You are a minister of God. Then Monday to Saturday, you're still a minister of God, as anointed, as called, as you were on Sunday. Nothing has changed. The only thing that has changed is on Sunday, you had an audience in front of you. Monday to Saturday, you're going about your, you know, your, your regular things, but you're still called of God. You're still a man of God. And nothing has changed, you know, God is still at work through you. So uh, let's just pause there. We'll pick it up again next uh, on Monday when we meet and uh, we can maybe spend a little bit more, uh, you know, a little bit more on, on, on that. Okay. Yeah. And thank you, Say. Uh, Say has shared, you know, these kinds of thoughts are just from the devil trying to just disturb you from the call, just you are called whether it's on Sunday, Monday to Saturday, you're still the same called person. And just be convinced about it. But let's talk more about it next uh, next week, okay? All right, because I'm gonna quickly pray and dismiss us. I don't want to take your break time. Uh, anyone could pray, sorry, I closed my video. Can I pray, Pastor? Yes, please. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father. You are so holy, so wonderful, Father. We thank you, Father, teaching your word, oh Lord Jesus, Father. Help us, whatever we learn, we will overcome those things which is bothering us, oh Lord Jesus, Father. Thank you, Father, showing the weapon to fight, oh Lord Jesus, Father. We thank you, Father, for your word, which gives us strength to fight mm -hmm. every day's battle, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your word, Lord Jesus, Father. Thank you, Father, for today, today's lesson. Thank you, Father, for Pastor and all of us, Lord Jesus, Father. We hope and we pray that with the help of Holy Spirit, we mm -hmm. will be practicing these things in our life, Lord Jesus, Father. Thank you once again for every lesson, Lord. In Jesus' sweet, precious name, I pray. Amen. 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 Man. Thank you, everyone. Sorry for taking extra time. Uh, you've got uh, just five minutes for your break, but um, enjoy the rest of your day. See you again soon. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Each one. Thank you. Thank you. Abraham, we'll talk again. God bless. Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye.